Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, inaugural lecture for the new Informal Urbanism Research Hub. My name is Kim Dovey. I'm Professor of Architecture and Urban Design in the Melbourne School of Design here at the University of Melbourne. And uh, it's my pleasure this evening to um, welcome Mark Purcell. But first I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners, both past and present, of the land on which this lecture takes place. This land was never ceded. Mark Purcell is a professor in the Department of Urban Design and Planning at the University of Washington, Seattle, where he researches urban politics, political theory, social movements and democracy. He's the author of numerous articles and books on issues of radical democracy and the right to the city, forms of urbanism where citizens manage the production of urban space in a manner that is resistant to both the state and to neoliberal capitalism. His books include Recapturing Democracy and my favourite, The Down Deep Delights of Democracy. He begins one of his papers, I'm not an anarchist, but I often get mistaken for one. Tonight you get to make up your own mind. We welcome Mark Purcell. No pressure. I can follow that. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here because I think INFER is a really exciting initiative and I feel lucky that Kim and Crystal asked me to participate with you in the launch, which is weird in a way because I'm not a scholar of informal urbanism, as I told Kim when he invited me. Why do you want me? I studied democracy, as he mentioned, and in particular democracy in cities, and I've thought a lot about the idea of the right to the city in that context. I guess it's fair to say that I'm very attuned to informal urbanism. I teach it to undergraduates because I think it's important. I have PhD students who study it very closely. And I think, as Henri Lefebvre thought, that there's something vitally important at work in the processes of informal urbanism. And in particular, in informal settlements in cities in the global south. And this is something that we absolutely must not miss. In saying that, though, I want to be careful. I'm trying to say that there's something going on that we need to pay attention to and even model our practice on without romanticizing informal urbanism and informal settlements in particular or overstating the promise that they hold or covering over the appalling inequality, brutality, and oppression that is often at work in them. So what I'll try to do today, tonight, is, and I hope you find this useful, is to articulate why I think informal urbanism is important. Of course, what I find important isn't the only way to value informal urbanism. I expect and welcome that other perspectives will see other values as well. And I'm sure this is an anim animating idea behind the hub. I guess I'm saying this out of uh, obligation. I think everyone here f has figured this out already, but that the hub is trying to draw together different perspectives into multiple encounters across a long period of time that will be productive. And so my idea of why these things, this process is important, uh, can come into an encounter with other ways that it's important. So of course, there's a lot of ways to think about informal, the distinction between informal urbanism and formal urbanism ways I'm sure most of you know more about than I do. And perhaps you can already tell from how I'm talking about it that I'm going to take a perspective that emphasizes the productive energy of informal urbanism as self-built and self-managed. And thus I'm taking my cue more from the work of people like Abdul Malik Simone or the way that Infer thinks about informal urbanism and less from people like Ananya Roy who emphasize how the distinction between informal and formal is used to oppress the poor in cities in the global south. These are both perfectly valid ways of going about thinking about it. My register or mode is going to be more Abdul Malik Simone than Ananya Roy. It's just how I am. <laughs> 
so for me, in this talk, informal urbanism signifies an urbanism in which the city is produced and managed by inhabitants themselves. This way of understanding it also evokes or prompts us to be attentive to the desire people have to produce and manage the city for themselves. And so formal urbanism would signify the extent to which the city is produced and managed for inhabitants by formal organizations or institutions. The state and capitalist corporations are the archetypes here. Perhaps in your own investigation, you have other ideas. And so formal urbanism also, for us, I think, evokes the, de the desire people have to have the city produced and managed for them. And both of these desires are things that I think urban, uh, informal urbanism uh, uh, calls our attention to and that helps us to be attentive to these, these desires. But you may already want to raise the question, what makes an organization formal? I'm just defining formal urbanism as that which is produced by formal things. So how is exactly these, how are these things formal? What's the difference between the self-organized urbanism that Infer identifies and formally organized urbanism? I think this distinction is where I can be helpful to you, despite the fact that I'm not a scholar of informal urbanism. Um, I think I can help by talking about the other terms that are on this slide. Democracy and an artificial person embodied and disembodied power, presentation and representation, and people and state. So to give you a little preview of what's coming, formal organizations are organizations of representative disembodied power. They are artificial persons and their quintessential form is the modern state. Let me try to unpack that very tight definition of informal urbanism a little bit. To do that, this is the fun part, we're going to talk about Hobbes. The reason I want to talk about Hobbes, about Thomas Hobbes and his book Leviathan primarily, is that I think when we look at Hobbes, Hobbes is the place to look if you want to understand the state. Hobbes is the place where we can peel back the layers and gaze on the core relation that the modern state establishes between us. How does he do this? What does he do? What's his argument? Hobbes insists that in our natural condition, what is usually called the state of nature. This natural condition is a condition of war of all against all, a bellum omnium contra omnis, in Hobbes' Latin version of this argument. The reason it's a war is because in our natural condition, we are all natural persons, he calls us, who are all roughly equal in intelligence and bodily strength. This is, by the way, the invention of the notion of we are all created equal. It happens in Hobbes's Leviathan. We're all equal to each other in strength and intelligence. Um, and each of us natural persons has possession of our own body and its powers. And in addition, we have what Hobbes calls a right of nature to use the power of our body to do whatever we think will help us survive. There are no laws in the state of nature to restrict the actions of natural persons. So, Hobbes concludes, any person can attack or even kill any other person at any time. Thus, the bellum omnium contra omnis. Hobbes says that we'll figure out pretty quickly that this is not a good situation. And we'll figure out that we have to leave it. And he goes on further to say what will happen is that we'll figure out that the problem is that we have power. The problem is that natural persons have possession of their body and its power, and they can use it however they see fit. So the solution, therefore, must be for natural persons to surrender their power. This is on the condition, of course, that all the other natural persons surrender their power as well. It's no good to surrender your own power and then have everyone else keep their power and then you're, 
that the bellum's not going to go well for you. So you say in the, famous, in the famous social contract, you say, I'll give up my power if you give up your power, and the other person says yes, and then you move on to the next person, and each one of us makes a contract with every other one of us to give up our power in reciprocal contract fashion. This is also the, the genesis of the contract that capitalism took and ran with. So much going on in Hobbes, we won't talk about that. I don't want to talk about capitalism for change. The, the contracts are established, but what should natural persons surrender their power to? You can't surrender, they can't surrender their power to another natural person or even a group of natural persons because natural persons having power is the problem. So they have to surrender their power to something other than natural persons. This is the famous frontispiece to the book. That's something other that we have to surrender our power to is what Hobbes calls an artificial person, a feigned person, a persona, a made-up entity, a leviathan, a figment of our imaginations. Natural persons surrender their power to an artificial person which receives their power and uses it to end the war, the bellum omnium contra omnis. It uses their power, in other words, to enforce peace. The artificial person is, of course, the state, the modern state, the great leviathan. It is down deep in the fibers of its very creation designed to be separate from us, other than us an artificial person rather than a natural one. It has to be separate from us because its purpose is to keep us away from our power. You can see the separation represented in the frontispiece. There's so much going on here too, but just one thing is that there's a separation between the artificial person and the folks in the town. You don't see any natural persons, but we presume we're urbanists that they're here in the town. It's not abandoned, right? It's a town. So the natural persons are here in a separate, out of remove from the artificial person. For those of you in the audience who are fans of or partial to the work of Deleuze and Guattari, I don't have time to go into this, but I can't resist pointing out the resonance between the frontispiece in Hobbes and Deleuze and Guattari's diagram of the state. And it's hard to overstate Hobbes's role for D&G for Deleuze and Guattari, he is the antithesis of their thought, or actually better, he's the antithesis of their political thought. Their political thought is designed to make Hobbes unthinkable. Hobbes is their primary target. I'll just, I can't resist going back and forward just for a second. Okay, that's enough. But I didn't come here to talk about Deleuze and Guattari, much as I might like to. Let's get back to Hobbes very quickly. Um, the artificial person is separate from us. Um, and this separation from our bodies is what I'm going to call a disembodied power. This disembodied power is the mass of the embodied power of natural persons that they've surrendered to an artificial body, to a disembodied body. I apologize for all of these bodies, for this anatomical language, which might be wearing on you already. And you might suspect, I hope, that I'm doing this because I'm influenced by Judith Butler and her political theory of bodies and how they matter. Or you might suspect that I'm lifting this terminology from Deleuze and Guattari and the body without organs, et cetera, et cetera. Or from Spinoza before D and G, who also were big, who also was a big fan of thinking in terms of bodies, and you wouldn't be entirely wrong in that. I'm interested in this language and terminology because of those influences, for sure. But the source of this language, the source of this way of thinking, is Hobbes. Witness what is essentially the abstract of the entire book. If you don't want to read the entire book, just read this. Slide. I know there's a lot of text on the slide. You're not supposed to have a lot of text on the slide, but it's the whole of Leviathan, so we're doing okay. The, sl the, the introduction to uh, Leviathan gives you this whole layout, and you can see the importance of the body in Hobbes's mind. He says, for by art rather than nature, 
is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state, which is but an artificial man, though of greater stature and strength than natural man, natural persons, for whose protection and defense the artificial person is intended. In this artificial man, Sovereignty is an artificial soul, an animating force that makes the body live, as giving life and motion to the whole body, the whole artificial body. And he goes on to have all this analogy. The magistrates are the joints, reward. The criminal justice system is the nerves. Uh, the counselors are uh, the artificial, um, the artificial uh, reason and will. It goes on to talk about all of these different things. Uh, concord for Hobbes, in other words, when the population is agreeing with each other, is the health of the body. And sedition, when there is fighting inside of the population, is sickness in the body. And civil war, which for Hobbes is the greatest of all evils imaginable on earth, represents the death of the body. And then he kicks it with this last sentence. Lastly, the pacts and covenants, those contracts that we were just making, by which the parts of this body politic were at first made, set together and united, resemble that fiat, or the let us make man, pronounced by God in the creation. The moment of God's creating human beings is the first incredible thing that happens in the world for Hobbes. And the second incredible thing is when we agree to surrender our power to create the modern state. These are roughly equivalent momentous events in history. But the thing that we're creating, we're bringing into being this artificial body, this artificial person, just as surely as God created natural persons. So Hobbes is at pains to explain that even though this artificial body isn't real, it's artificial, Still, it has to stand in for natural persons. The state has to pretend to be the people, to be, sorry, I should never make the mistake, pretend to be people, to feign identity with them. It has to represent them, to represent people. Hobbes says it personates them, and we, today we would say it impersonates them. Their real presentation of themselves as natural persons, as natural bodies, is represented by the artificial person, the artificial body of the state. Hobbes is crystal clear here. The artifice or charade of representation, this lie, is an absolutely essential element of the state. The state has to be other than the people an entirely different kind of thing than people. But it also must stand in for them, claim to act on their behalf, claim to be them. Nietzsche is famous for saying this, that the state is the name of the coldest of all cold monsters. Coldly it tells lies too, and this lie crawls from its mouth. I, the state, am the people. But it wasn't Nietzsche who revealed this fundamental lie at the core of the state. It was Hobbes, as he created it. Maybe just one more thing on Hobbes, and then I'll move on to something that you might want to move on to. One more thing, the state is sovereign. The state must not only be separate from us, it must, must also be above us. It must be sovereign. It must be what Hobbes calls in this quote, a mortal god. Its power has to be able to, he says, overawe us all, to cause us to cower, to obey, so that we will not start the war again, so that peace will prevail. The Latin phrase over the artificial body says, known as potestas super terum quae comparatur a. There is no power on earth that compares to it. It's a quote from Job. Here he is again, going back and forth between God and the mortal God. There is no power on earth that compares to it. A mortal God, a disembodied body, apart from us, looming over us, controlling us by terrorizing us, 
For Hobbes, this generation of the state is the birth of civilization, the transformation of humans from base, natural persons into civilized ones, the transformation of our human condition from savage war into peace and prosperity, the creation of this artificial person. OK, maybe that's enough horror for today. Maybe there's something more bright that we can move on to. I hope it's clear enough, that discussion about the birth of this disembodied sovereign power, and that the state's an apparatus of separation and domination. But how does democracy fit in here? How can we conceptualize democracy in this context? There's so much that I would like to say to you about that, but in the interests of time and keeping to time, let me just try to put it in a, a relatively uh, pared down fashion. Let me propose to you that democracy is nothing other than what it says it is. Demos, people, join to their kratia, their power. In democracy, people have their power. They possess it. It's available to them, vested in their bodies. It's an embodied power. And they actively use this power. They practice using it to manage their affairs for themselves. So as you can probably see, actually, Pretty quickly, democracy runs afoul of Hobbes almost right from the get-go, since the entire purpose of Hobbes' artificial person is to separate power from the bodies of people and vest it in the body of the artificial person. And democracy, of course, is when people are jointed to their power. So it follows for us to say at this point that democracy, real democracy, is the antithesis of the state, and vice versa. Here you might be wanting to ask, OK, that idea of democracy sounds intuitively right, but that's not how we really usually think about democracy, is it? We have a different way of thinking about what democracy means. And that's true. There's another way to think about democracy, which is, I'll admit, the dominant way. And this way imagines democracy to be a society that's ruled by a state whose officers are chosen by people in periodic elections. But that society is properly a liberal democratic state, even though it gets called democracy all the time. I don't know if we're just tired, we don't want to say that whole phrase, and we just shorten it by saying democracy, or whether we're truly believing that those are the same thing. A society ruled by the state, though, by Hobbes' artificial person, can never be actual democracy. It can never be a way of life in which people are joined with their power. Reading Hobbes helps us realize that each election in a liberal democratic polity is really just a pageant that reenacts the Hobbesian contract, whereby people surrender their power voluntarily to an artificial person that represents them. So let me say this clearly. The idea that the liberal democratic state is the same thing as democracy is a corruption of the idea of democracy. It's a flagrant misuse of the word. In democracy, people do not surrender their power to an artificial person. They retain, they retain their power and they use their power to manage their affairs for themselves. OK, maybe you bought that part, too. And you're saying, all right, OK, liberal democracy is not the same thing as real democracy. But still, if Hobbes is right, then democracy, properly understood, would be a disaster, right? Because people will have possession of their power. And what will they do with it? A bellum omnium contra omnis will be the inevitable result if Hobbes is to be taken at his word. And here is where Hobbes, who is so often wrong, is at his most wrong, I think. There's no reason to think that when we have possession of our power, we will wage war necessarily. We are, of course, capable of the full range of human behaviors and relations. So when we have possession of our power, we most likely will use it in a whole bunch of different ways, in all the ways we're capable of using it. We'll be competitive and will also be cooperative, 
will be cruel and also kind. We will make war and also peace. So democracy, when people have their power, when their power is embodied, is no more likely to be a state of total war than it is to be a state of total peace. We don't know what it will be. We can't know what it will be because it can always become whatever we decide it should become. The only thing we know for sure is that in democracy, we won't be guaranteed peace by a terrifying disembodied power. In democracy, it is up to us what our lives will become. If standing on the edge of so enormous and unknown hasn't scared you off and you're tempted or even already willing to take the plunge, you might say, ah, oh, so this is great. Democracy is not that difficult to achieve. We already had it before Hobbes led us down the garden path. We merely need to cancel Hobbes's contract and slip back into the state of nature before we surrendered our power, before Hobbes's terrible monster was given life. But maybe even in my saying it out loud, I suspect you're catching on that it isn't true. There is no primordial state of nature to go back to. It doesn't exist because it's a thought experiment. Democracy isn't our default position. It's not our er community. Or maybe it's better to say that our default community is everything, all the communities that we're capable of becoming. And this is true of our desire as well. We are capable of all the desires that we are capable of. We desire to live in democracy. We desire to manage our affairs for ourselves. But we also desire to live in the state. We desire to have our affairs managed for us. So I argue that the right way to think about democracy is this. Democracy is, and it has to always be, an insistent, perpetual, and challenging project into the future, a project to become democratic, a project to develop our desire to manage our affairs for ourselves, to develop our desire to retain our power, to develop our desire for embodied power, for, pre for presentation, and a project to leave aside our desire to have our affairs managed for us, leave aside our desire to surrender our power, leave aside our desire for disembodied power, for representation. To do this, we must practice. We have to experiment. We have to begin the project of democracy today and carry it forward consistently in small, everyday acts of self-management. I guess we could carry it forward in spectacular grand acts of self-management as well. I'm not opposed to those. But I do know that it have to be also small everyday acts, small decisions to manage your affairs for yourselves rather than our affairs for ourselves, rather than have them managed for us. So that's my sense of democracy and how it does not comport with Hobbes's view of the world. But here we are in a design school. I guess we might have actually left the design school and we're in a different school. But we were in a design school a minute ago. And I'm offering nothing but very old and very esoteric and abstract political theory. What about space? What about the city? What about the built environment? The way I typically enter into this question is by turning to the concept of the right to the city. In whatever form you encounter this, and there are massive debates about what this term means, it always means uh, it always involves people making political claims on space and on urban space in particular. So it's uh, uh, a concept that by default connects the politics that I've been discussing to the question of urban space, the production of urban space, the management of urban space. But the right to the city I want to document can be understood in two very different ways that I've tried to outline here on that on that thing that keeps following us, the er uh, slide. Um, it can be a juridical right, 
And that's when people ask the state to guarantee some urban good like public services or uh, affordable housing or transportation, tenure uh, in land um, or access to particular spaces, that kind of thing. And this right to the city, this juridical right, is a plea to the artificial person, as I hope we're able to see now. But the right to the city can also be this other thing on the slide. It can be what Lefebvre meant it to be, which is a cry and a demand. I don't have time to bore you with the intricate details, but the upshot is that Lefebvre saw this cry to be a declaration a declaration made by urban inhabitants that they intend to begin the project of producing and managing urban space themselves, for themselves. A declaration, in other words, that they intend to begin the project of a specifically urban democracy. I think it's true, it might not be true, I think it's true, that this cry was born in the global north in Paris in the 1960s, but it also has been raised quite clearly in cities in the global south, in megacities, in informal settlements, in places like Cape Town and Rio and Mexico City. And so I think there's a way to connect the right to the city discourse to the question of uh, urbanization in general, to informal urbanism and to informal settlements in particular. So if we return to this question of informal urbanism and put it into the context of the right to the city that we were just discussing, informal urbanism or informal urbanization, maybe, might be seen as the doing without the declaration, as the doing of urban democracy, people actually producing and managing urban space for themselves without the artificial person. Informal urbanism is perhaps less overtly political than the right to the city, less, se less self-consciously democratic, more quotidian than the right to the city, but it is also much more ubiquitous, engaged in by many, many more people than the cry, the demand, the right to the city. Let me be very clear again that informal urbanism, and here I'm thinking of informal settle settlements in, the, in cities in the global south in particular, is not utopia, it's not at all. Neither is democracy or the right to the city. As we saw with democracy, the absence of the artificial person doesn't produce an ideal society. The real spaces and real communities produced by informal urbanization are often hierarchical, patriarchal, oppressive, unequal. And of course, none of those spaces anywhere or communities are purely democratic. None are entirely free from disembodied power or from, the desire for, uh, or from the desire to have a disembodied power rule over them. And maybe if I could generalize over a phenomenon that's impossible to generalize over, it might be fair to say that in formal settlements, at least very often, people both have achieved incredible feats of self-production and self-management and have developed a very intense desire for such self-produced urbanism, and at the same time, experience serious privation, like for example, a lack of sewers, and they desire very much that the state should address that privation, should provide them with sewers like it provides the rest of the city with sewers. That's exactly what we might expect from a project for democracy. Both of those desires at work, both native to our, to our humanity, both vying to take precedence of the struggle that is taking place. What I want to call attention to, what I want us not to miss, is how massive the achievements in self-production and self-management often are, and how strong the desire for democracy often is in many places in informal settlements in the global south. So this is going to end up seeming like an advice slide, and I don't really mean it to be an advice slide, but maybe it's a sketching of a terrain that, in, that INFER is going to move into and uh, some decisions that might uh, present themselves. Um, and thinking about INFER in this context as a research hub in a design school, it seems to me there are at least two modes for how to grapple with informal urbanism. 
The first mode is that of research to better understand what informal urbanism is and how it works. Of course, it's imperative to continue fine-grained empirical work. And here, I would urge us to not get lost in the privation, in the poverty, not to miss the resolve, creativity, and potential that is also at work. And the second mode, because of the design school, is a mode of intervention. Here, one of these options is fairly well known. As someone who comes from a planning department, I'll call this the planner's desire to solve the problem to transform informal urbanism into formal urbanism, privation into sufficiency. We can see this in the slum-free city narrative that's uh, going on in many places. Um, but there might be, in addition to that solve instinct, another option for intervention. We might instead seek out and learn to recognize the project for democracy that is often at work in places and we might nourish that project, help it to grow on its own terms, and even to spread beyond its current situation. Let me end by returning to my home ground, the esoterica of theory, to say just a word about the city of Ur. In doing so, I think, I'll disagree with Deleuze and Guattari, maybe also Jacques Rancière, and possibly I will offend my generous hosts, although I hope not. But as we saw with democracy, I'm not sure how useful it is to think in terms of a primordial condition, to think, in other words, in terms of er. In for, at times, as articulated the idea, I think Kim said this tonight uh, from his soapbox, which is a very tempting idea, one that I find at least incredibly tempting, that informal urbanism is the original or er form of the city and of citizenship. But despite how tempting that is, I think it's better, if more unsettling, to think of informal urbanism as no more er than formal urbanism, just as democracy is no more er than the artificial person. Both urbanisms are already there at the beginning. Neither is more natural to us or more true to who, to who we are or true to what the city is. We're equally capable of both informal and formal urbanism. We desire both informal and formal urbanism. And so I think informal urbanism, like democracy, has to be a project through which we develop our desire for informal urbanism, our desire to produce and manage the city for ourselves. And we leave aside our desire for formal urbanism, our desire to have the city produced and managed by the artificial person. That kind of a project won't be easy at all. It will require us to practice and to develop and to grow, but I think if we're doing it right, it will be a joyous project. It'll be a project that grows increasingly joyous the more we practice it. So thank you all for coming and for listening. Thanks again to Kim and Crystal for giving me the opportunity to be with you here today. Thanks. Thanks.